Man, isn't it good to worship the Lord? Praise God. He is worthy to be honored in worship. Praise God. Well, we're in a series right now called Wonder. And actually, that's part of why we're in this series is to focus on, think about, talk about all of the amazing things that God has done and just the amazing parts of who He is, the parts of His character. Uh, We talked about, you know, the fact that God is eternal. We talked about the fact that God's Word is eternal. And this week, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And just giving you kind of a a preview, I guess, is focusing on and thinking about how really unbelievable it is that when we become a believer that we get a measure of the Spirit of God on the inside of us. It's it's quite fascinating and and amazing to think about. But I want to start here and I want to present it a little different way to you this morning. Um, if you were here around youth camp, so last June when the, when the kids came back from camp, I spent several weeks talking on the Holy Spirit, the role of the Holy Spirit, particularly uh, on the experience that every believer can have with the Holy Spirit from the book of Acts. I'm not going to do that this morning too much, um, but I want to start here because when I was a teenager, I remember the first time I saw a drama that was put on in church and they they have several of them they're named different things but the one I saw was called Heaven's Gates Hell's Flames anybody ever seen something similar to that you know big production that basically shows you the lives of people and what happens when they go to hell and what happens when they go to heaven and I saw it every year it was done at my church I loved it then I was later part of several several other ones that I'd seen And one of the things that was always amazing to me when I would watch it, I would think to myself, why is it that when hell is depicted, I'll just say it this way, it's it's so amazing. And, you know, it's dark, it's gloomy, it's spooky, the music, everything is like intense. And and it just, it like wake up all these different emotions in you. And then the devil would come out, his voice is all super raspy. And he's just like, all these demons are around him and it's like super intense. And then when it was heaven, I mean, it was good, but it just wasn't as powerful as the hell one. And by the way, I think everybody who got saved at Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flame, I'm pretty sure it was because of what they saw with hell, not because of what they saw with heaven. I think they were like terrified into getting saved. Um, which I don't care how you come in. You can get scared. I don't care. It don't make me any different. You can get scared in, loved in. I don't care. It doesn't matter. But I just remember hell was always depicted so, and it just, it was so easy, it seemed like, to create that emotion in people with it. But when it came to heaven, it was like the harp playing, you know, ooh, and you had, you know, a few white sheets and the angels with the little fake halos. And it just, it just didn't quite give that same emotion that, that hell gave. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I mean, you know, you've seen it. And I just wonder about that, like, and I've noticed being a part, be, being, in, being a Christian for as long as I have, that sometimes people are almost more, I'm not saying this is good or bad, it's just a fact. I've, I've noticed that people are almost sometimes more enamored with, with the satanic and, and wicked side of things than they are with the, the godly side of things. Let me, I'll give you another example. You know, how many of you pray over your kids? You know, maybe at night or you know, just when they're not around, or you go and you, you lay your hands on them, you pray over them, and you know, if you, you can imagine bringing your child, laying your hands on them, and say, you know, I pray over you that you're going to do the will of God. I pray over you that you're going to be blessed all of your life. I pray over you that you're going to have wisdom, you know, and, and you can kind of feel the emotions as I'm saying that, and it's good. It feels good, but imagine the other side of it if I brought my kid, and I laid my hands on them, and I said, you are an idiot, You'll never do anything with your life. You are a complete loser, and you're going to follow the the path and way of Satan your whole life. Doesn't that elicit a completely different emotion? (laughs) Like, like we don't think, we don't always connect that, oh, you said those good things over your kid, but we know what saying those bad things over your kid would do. And like, if you imagine a kid having to hear those things from their parents, we're all like, well, man, that kid's going to need counseling if he, if they hear their parents say that over them. 
because we have so much confidence some, sometimes it seems like we're almost more confident in the, the wicked and the evil side of things than we are the godly. But how many know that speaking life over your kids has, has more power, I believe, than saying, you know, negative things over them? But, but we don't always seem to understand that. And I've, I've just, I've noticed this enamor, this, this like fascination sometimes with the evil and the wicked side of things, even when it comes to movies. Like if you think about Star Wars, everybody's favorite character is Darth Vader. I mean, you know, you got, you got light, you got Jedi and stuff like that, but everyone's enamored with Darth Vader. Ask any kid at Halloween who they want to be. If they're a Star Wars fan, it's Darth Vader. You know, they don't want to be Luke, you know, with the lightsaber. They want to be Darth Vader. And it's, the, again, there's this fascination sometimes with it. And I also feel like this is the case sometimes with the Holy Spirit. Now, if we talked about demon possession, if we talked about somebody being demon possessed and what that looked like, and we compared it with somebody being filled with the Holy Spirit, again, we're going to view those things completely different. And we should because they, they are extremely different. And that's actually what I want to do this morning is to compare and contrast the, the different ways that because the, the spiritual world is very real and there is a demonic and Satan is real, demons are real, God is real, angels are real, the Holy Spirit is real. And so you can look at both of these things to sort of learn about the other if that makes sense. So we're going to start in Matthew chapter 12 verse 43. Now one of the things you'll learn as you read through the Bible is you'll learn that every good thing that God creates, Satan tries to counterfeit in some way. He's not very original, not very creative. You know, God creates the Garden of Eden. He, he explains the, the fruit and he, he explains the tree of life to, the, to Adam and Eve and all of that. And then Satan comes along and he tries to present a, a totally different view on it, a totally different side on it. And you'll notice this pattern throughout the Bible that every good thing that God creates, Satan tries to create a counterfeit for it. That's almost exclusively what all sin is. If you look at all sin, what it is, there's probably an opposite to it that is good, that God created and, and God said is okay. Math chap Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, um, we're going we're gonna to begin to look at some elements of the demonic to understand how the Holy Spirit works, just as a different way of understanding. So Matthew chapter 12, 43, it says, when the unclean, Jesus is kind of teaching on demons, really, and he says, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, meaning it's been cast out, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came, and when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. And then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also it will be with this evil generation. So he's teaching on the demonic. And basically this is what he explains. He says, if a demon is cast out of a person. In other words, if, if someone had a, a, a demon in, his spirit, uh, in their spirit. And that demon is cast out if they don't then become born again and they don't have the Holy Spirit to fill them to replace that uh, basically what he explains is that that demon's going to come back and it's going to bring some more demons with it and he said the, the state the end state is going to be worse than the beginning so G we don't understand a lot about the demonic but how I many you know Jesus he knew a few things about it he understood the spiritual world and how it works and how it operates and so he explains he explains this so we learn a lot from this passage. The first thing that we learn is that spirits can go in and out of a person. You see, this, this goes to the very foundation of what a human being is. Um, from a natural standpoint, science and, and from a worldly standpoint would basically tell us that we are mostly just organic matter, right? You're a body, you have a heart, you have a brain. When those stop working, that's the, that's the end of life. But actually, that's not the most real part of you. The most real part of you and the part of you that's most like God is your spirit. Your spirit is eternal. 
And no matter what happens to your body, your spirit will be eternal. It will, it will have eternal life with God or it will have eternal death in hell with Satan. This is what the Bible teaches. So we know a lot about the physical body. Doctors can teach us a lot about that. We know less but still more about the, the mind and how it works from psychology and things like that. But most people have a very, very small understanding of the spiritual part of us. But man is three parts, spirit, soul, and body, or spirit, mind, and body. And that's what makes up a person. That's what makes up a human being. So we learn, though, that spiritually, that other spirits can come into this body. So the body is like a shell. The body's like a house for our spirit. But we learn that other spirits can come in to our body. And this is the most basic understanding of what demon possession is. Not only can one spirit come in, apparently several, several spirits can come in. Here he mentions seven. How do you remember the guy that Jesus cast the demons out of? And they called him Legion. He said, for we are many. They didn't give a number, but he said, there's a lot of us. We've lost count. <laughs> there's a lot of us in here. So your spirit, the, your body is home to your spirit. But the question is, what other spirits are in there. And the Bible talks about demon interaction with human beings um, from different standpoints and it uses different words. So one word that is used when talking about demons is they, the, uh, Jesus or the scripture will say this person is demon oppressed. Well that's very different than being demon possessed. Okay? Demon oppression when you, when you look at it typically means that there's demonic activity in your life, but it's coming from the outside in. In other words, you're, there's, nothing, there's nothing in your spirit, but there's, there's demons working in your life, and they're oppressing this person. Okay, then the Bible talks about uh, being, being demonized or terrorized by a demon. And, and, and so this time you, you, you start to see like, oh, people are hearing voices and they're hearing things and they're, so there is, it's kind of taking a step up from oppression. Then you read about people who are demon possessed. And that word, when you, when you look it up in the Greek, which is what the New Testament was written in, when you, when you look that word up, that's exactly what it means. It means that this thing has taken control. You are no longer the captain you are no longer the pilot. Now it may not always be like that in everyday life, but there are moments where that demon takes over a person's life and is in control and they're, and they're doing things that they feel like they don't have control over. Okay? This is what the Bible teaches. I know y'all didn't come this morning thinking you was going to hear about demons and, and demon possession and all of that, but how many know this is in the Bible? And the Bible has a lot to say about it. And you can, we're not talking about the boogeyman. We're not talking about some weird thing out there. We're talking about the reality of the way things are. And as a matter of fact, uh, the Bible is very clear that there is a spiritual world and there is a natural world. And if you could pull the veil back, some of us would be shocked at what we could see going on. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches us uh, to not focus too much on the natural and the flesh. He said, because you're going to miss the point, and you're going to find yourself wrestling against flesh and blood. But he said, there's a lot more going on behind the scenes that's directing and controlling that than just human beings. That's why it doesn't do any good to get mad at the culture. It doesn't do any good to get mad at, at political opponents. It doesn't do any good to get mad at things that are going on as human beings because there are, there are spirits, there's demonic activity behind it that is trying to control and force things. This is why some people have come up with the idea of like the Illuminati, you know, that there's some big great force like controlling the world and they don't believe in demons and all that so they just look at it and go, well it has to be something controlling it because it spans generations that these strategies and these things would be used and, and how could that be unless there was some organization controlling it? Oh, I got news for it. It's not an organization. Uh, it's a kingdom. It's the kingdom of darkness. And it's at work. And you go, well, you know, I, I don't know if I believe in demons and all that. Well, first of all, you know, it doesn't really matter what you believe in. It's what the reality is. And if you don't believe it, then you don't believe the Bible. And then we got a whole different problem. But this is very, these things are very real, and they are, <clears throat> they are at work. Now, it, you may not be encountering people on a regular basis that are demon-possessed, 
Even though the Bible does teach us that as, as believers through the name of Jesus Christ and through the blood of Jesus Christ, every believer has authority and power over demons. And Jesus taught his disciples this. You remember when he sent the, I believe it was the 72, he sent them out and he gave them authority and power in the name of Jesus. And when they came back, they were shocked. They said, even the demons obey us in your name. They couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe it because they didn't understand about spiritual things and how the, these spiritual things work. And so they had to learn it and be taught it over time. Um, so you may be like that. You may just, I don't know anything about these things. Well, that's okay, but they're still real and they still exist. So we learn, first of all, that spirits can go in and out of a person. Jesus taught us this. He said it's cast out, wanders around for a while, comes back, finds, huh, still unoccupied. Let me get a few of my friends and, and come back. In this instance, that happens. Uh, <clears throat> we learn that multiple spirits can go into the same person, and we learn that these spirits are called unclean. And the word used for unclean is akathartos, and it means impure or contaminated. Impure or contaminated. And this, of course, goes back to what a demon is, which is really a fallen angel. So an angel that has been contaminated or corrupted through sin, a lot like humans were, were corrupted or contaminated through sin. But he calls these spirits over and over again in the New Testament, he says they are unclean, or meaning contaminated, impure, because they are fallen they are fallen angels. Now, what is the intent of these spirits? Why would a spirit, why would a demonic spirit come into a person's life? Well, to fulfill the overall mission and purpose of Satan, which is to steal, kill, and destroy. That's, that's their purpose through any means necessary. Now, a demon, please understand this, a demon cannot override the human will. A, a demon has to be given access and, and the, a person has to open the door and yield for that demon to come in. But a lot of times people don't know that what they're doing is actually yielding to the demonic. So people do silly things. You know, they, they play around with Ouija boards. They, they get crystals and they do chants and they do things like that. And, they, and even they watch horror movies and things. And they think, oh, it's simple, it's nothing. Well, yeah, but what you're doing is you're giving access and permission to demons to come into your life. And a lot of people don't like that because they think, oh, there ain't nothing to it. Well, that's exactly what the devil wants you to think. There ain't nothing to it. But how do you think he gets access and he gets foothold and he gets an entrance in? It's by you yielding because he can't override your will. And he can't make you do something until you give permission and you give him access and you grant him permission in. And this is exactly what he did with Adam and Eve, right? He's on the outside. Look, at he has no authority, no power. Can't make them eat of the fruit. He's on the outside, and, and he goes, he, he has to talk to them and get them to yield to his command. He has to trick them to choose to let him in. It happens in the next generation. Cain and Abel. Cain is thinking about murdering his brother. God, in this instance, comes to Cain, and he explains. He said, Cain, sin is crouching at the door. He said, but you must rule over it. So the picture I get when he says that is Satan's not in yet. He's on the outside. He's on the outside of a door. And the only way he can get in is by Cain opening that door. And so he says, sin is crouching at the door, but you must rule over it. In other words, you must keep it out. That's, that's your job, but you're the gatekeeper. Well, a lot of people know nothing about these things, so they're just opening the door wide letting Satan in at every, at every turn. And it can, as the more a person does that, the more they yield to sin, the more they yield to the satanic, uh, whether you know it or not, whether it's intentional or not, when you do it, you're letting Satan in more and more in your life. On the other side, we can see how this works with God. A person has to yield to God. A person has to let God in. And a person can yield more and more and more to the Holy Spirit and see the work of God active more and more and more in their life. This whole earth has been set up and built around the human will. We, that's the way God did it. That's the way things are the way that they are. A lot of people look around the world and they go, they blame God for stuff. But see, God put power with us and he gave us a human will and the reason why a lot of things are the way that they are is because humans have chosen it that's how powerful the human will is so the intent of these spirits <clears throat> is very simple 
Steal, kill, and destroy at any means necessary, any, any way that they can. Steal, kill, and destroy from the person that they are inhabiting or oppressing. Steal, kill, and destroy from the family members that are associated with this person. Steal, kill, and destroy from every person that comes in contact with them. Basically to wreak havoc on this person's life and everybody that is connected to them. Can you imagine living with a spouse that was being influenced by demons? Or now don't rate I know don't poke your spouse right I know I saw some of you look, hmm, I don't have to imagine it. Hmm. Well, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, it's probably not your spouse. But <clears throat> but can you imagine living with a spouse that is demon possessed? When you read the Bible, every one of these encounters of somebody that was demon possessed, that's somebody's spouse, that's somebody's child, that's someone's daughter, that's someone's family member. How many of you have ever had family members that they just, they're going off the rails? Okay, don't raise your hand. Just, ah, don't raise your hand. They might be in here. <clears throat> okay, just this is a rhetorical, rhetorical question. How many might have, you know, you, there's a family member going off the rails. And man, the way it can affect everything. Everybody's praying, everybody, and then, oh, you find out a new thing. And man, everybody's in an uproar right about the time you think it's settling down. You find out something new. They're hurting themselves. They're hurting someone else. Oh, now they have kids involved. And we got to step in and, and rescue the kids. And it's it just everything, steal, kill, destroy constantly through demonic influence in their life or just through the power of sin in their life. But can you imagine, what if it was one of your own children? Maybe some of you have experienced this. One of your own children, seeing a child, you don't even know how this happened, a child being influenced by the power of the devil. Well, this is what happens in Mark chapter 9, verse 17. <clears throat> it says, someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you. So this is somebody's son. Okay, we all, many of you have children in here. I want you to imagine if this was one of your children. Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute, cannot speak. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able to. He answered them, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. In other words, Jesus is getting frustrated because the disciples, they hadn't learned the lessons yet, and they missed it on this one. They brought the boy to him, and when the Spirit saw Jesus, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground, rolled about, foaming at the mouth, and Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. So this has been going on a while. And it has often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. See, that's the, that's the goal, steal, kill, and destroy. It's often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse. So that most of them said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. And he arose. <clears throat> so you can imagine the, the destruction and the issues that this has caused in this family for years. This has been going on. And this, this demon had been involved in this child's life. Who knows how it came in? Could have came through the, the parents' decisions because they have authority over the child. Who knows how this got there? We're not told that. But this child's been dealing with it. This family's been dealing with it for all of these years. And Jesus finally comes. He rebukes it by the name of Jesus. Now, from other teaching in Scripture, we find out that really the work is just beginning in this, in this child's life. Just because you've got rid of the demon, you still got a lot, of, lot to do here. You can't just leave that person in their, in their position of, of getting the devil out of their life. They now have to be filled with something else. They have to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God, and they have to be filled with the Word of God you can't just leave them in that, in that condition. Now, <clears throat> the reason that 
I'm showing you this is because I want to talk about the work of the Holy Spirit, but I, wanna, I wanted you to have the, the way that Satan tries to counterfeit it and the way that he tries to operate in a person's life versus the way that God wants to operate in your life through his Holy Spirit, okay? So the Holy Spirit operates much differently than these unclean spirits operate. Now, I have to back up just a minute and, and say that, you know, we're not going to lay a big, long foundation this morning about the, the doctrine or the theology that when a person gets saved, that they are filled with the Holy Spirit. But this is a, this is a basic foundational teaching of Christianity, is that that's actually what it means to become saved is that your spirit is born again and that you receive a measure of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. And so now you have the Spirit of God, not the spirit of a demon. You have the Spirit of God living and dwelling on the inside of you. The book of Romans actually tells us that the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, the same Spirit, the same Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, but he operates much differently, much differently than a demon operates. He doesn't operate the same way. So we're going we're gonna to look at some of those things. Um, and if you compare the two, this is interesting to me, if you compare the two, a person could be led to think that the, the fruit or the evidence of a person being demon-possessed seems way more powerful and obvious than a person who is filled with the Holy Spirit. Like if you think about somebody and, they, and you, you could literally see them being demon possessed and like all these things we talked about, right? Grinding teeth, foaming at the mouth, throwing on the ground, you know, uh, doing horrible. You could see, wow, this person is obvious, the fruit of what it looks like for a person to be demon possessed. And then you have like maybe in this room, you got people saying, well, I've been filled with this Holy Spirit. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. So I, I'm a different person. Well, the fruit of that doesn't look the same as somebody being demon possessed. Matter of fact, you could compare the two and go, well, it looks like the fruit of being demon possessed is a little more intense than being filled with the Holy Spirit. But the reason for that is the purpose and intent with which they have come into your life. Now remember, the purpose of an intent of, of a demon is to steal, kill, and destroy through any means necessary, and they will take as much control as you will give them. But the Holy Spirit operates completely different. Unclean spirits take forceful control, but the, the primary role of the Holy Spirit is to guide and influence. To guide and influence. He does not force, and he does not seek to take control of your will. It doesn't work like that. I've, I've even heard people pray or, or sing songs like that. Oh, just take control of me, Lord. You know, just Holy Spirit, take control of my life. Take control. Well, he's not going to take control. That's not what he does. He doesn't take control. He's given you control. Now, he will guide you. He will influence you. He will speak to you. He will give you all the tools that you need to do what you're supposed to do. But he's not going to take control of you. That's not how the Holy Spirit works. Satan will do that. But God doesn't do that. The Holy Spirit does not take control like that. John chapter 14, verse 16, says it like this. Jesus is talking about the role of the Holy Spirit, and when he comes, what the Holy Spirit will look like. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Remember that word. We're going to come back to that word in just a minute. It says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So the Holy Spirit, when Jesus leaves, he's going to send the Holy Spirit. Read about it in the book of Acts, chapter 2. The Holy Spirit is poured out, and now the Holy Spirit, it says, for he dwells with you and he will be in you. When you got saved, if you've been truly born again, you have received the bat you have received the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is active and working in your life. Verse 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things 
and he will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So we get an idea here of some of the things that the Holy Spirit is going to do. He's going to guide. He's going to teach. Another place says that he will reveal the future to us. Uh, he will guide us into all truth. He will teach us and he'll bring to remembrance the things that Jesus has, has taught us. So let's look at this word helper because the word helper is a, is a translation of the original Greek word that was used here when this was written. Again, the New Testament was written in Greek, which was a kind of a universal language at that point. So the word used here for helper is the word paraclete or parakletos. And I want, to, I want to explain to you what this word means because the people who were hearing Jesus, they would have, they would have understood this word because it was, a, it was a common word used for other things. That, it wasn't used so much to describe an element of God. Uh, this was kind of the first time that this word was ever used to explain an aspect of God. But it was a common word that was used in their legal system. So in the context of Greek and Roman legal practice, a parakletos referred to a legal advocate uh, and, and could be like a lawyer. There was another word for lawyer, but a lawyer w- would be referred to as a parakletos as well. But it was a legal advocate, someone who defended or interceded on behalf of another person in a court of law. This role involved offering both legal representation and personal support. So very simply, you, you, you know, you imagine you've got yourself into a pickle, you're in, you're in trouble, and you need someone else that knows more than you, that understands the, com- the complexities of a legal system, that, that can come in, advise you, support you, can connect you to the right people so that when you have to stand before the judge, you're not standing there alone. They're not going to do it for you, but they're going to they're going to guide you into all the right steps and teach you and show you how you should do, how you should act, how you should dress, how you should speak in front of the judge. And again, they have connections, influences that you don't have. That's what this word meant uh, specifically. In a more general use, it was, it was uh, used to denote any helper, advisor, or supporter who stands by an individual to provide aid, comfort, or counsel. Uh, this could be in various contexts, not just legal, but also personal and communal support systems. So now you, when we go back and read this, you get a better understanding. That's why the, the English word used is helper, because it's just so broad. Basically, the Holy Spirit is someone that has come into your life to help you with every single thing that you're going to do as a human being. I mean, the Holy Spirit can help you in your marriage. The Holy Spirit can help you raise your kids. The Holy Spirit can help you understand the Bible. The, help, the Holy Spirit can help you uh, draw closer to God through worship. The Holy Spirit can lead you when it comes to important financial and life decisions. Well, these opportunities come up. Do I do this or do I do that? Guess what? The Holy Spirit can help. And so many times we don't turn to him. He's not, he's not forceful the way that a demon is. He doesn't force himself upon us, but he's always there and he's always in us to help us with every single decision. Can I just tell you that from the time I was a teenager that I learned to depend on the Holy Spirit. I, the, I prayed and sought God and, and sought <clears throat> the wisdom of the Holy Spirit when it came to who I was going to date. If I was going to marry that person, where I was going to go to college, where I was going to have my first job in the ministry, which church I was going to work at, whether or not to start this church or not. Every decision that comes up in the church. Do we do life groups? Do we not? Do we build this building? Do we not? What ministries do we start? Which ones do we not? Who do we hire? Do we not? On and on again, how many know the Holy Spirit knows everything? And I thank God for the Holy Spirit. I thank God for the work of the Holy Spirit, the role of the Holy Spirit in my life, and that's His job. And what a shame that so many people, so many of us have access, literally, to the God of the universe that knows everything, knows the end from the beginning, and won't even ask Him. We, we'd assume, we'd just assume call a friend and ask them who doesn't know anything versus take time to get along with God and seek the counsel of the Holy Spirit. His role in our life is so significant. And and think about, this is why Jesus told the disciples, he said, it's actually better for you that I leave. He said, it's better. 
because as a human being, he was limited. He couldn't be there like that for them. But, but many of us, we treat the Holy Spirit and we interact with the Holy Spirit uh, in a way that would almost be opposite. It would be better for you if Jesus were here because you don't take advantage of the Holy Spirit. We don't, we don't use it. But the way Jesus said it, think about it, he told his disciples, he said, it's better for you that I leave. And yet, they were living with him at the time that he said that. They were walking with him every day. And he said, it's better for you that I leave. In other words, the, the power and role of the Holy Spirit in your life is going to be more effective and more efficient than my ro current role in your life. And the reason is because even though I'm living with you, I still have to sleep. I still have other people that I have to be attentive to and other people I've got to be involved in. But when you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, you never have a moment alone. You never have to, he never has to take a break. He's never too busy. He's never talking to somebody else and can't talk to you. You always have access to him to, for guidance, for leadership, for truth, for wisdom, for help in every single capacity. So if we compare and contrast the, the work of the the work of the demonic and the work of the Holy Spirit, you begin to see how they operate completely different. If the, if the primary purpose of a demon is to steal, kill, and destroy, and then Jesus went on to say, he said, but I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And that word life is zoe life. It's the God kind of life. And so you could think of it this way. The Holy Spirit has come to help you spread zoe life into every area of your life and every single thing that you come in contact with. He's come to help spread life and joy and peace and those things into every area of your life. Now, the Bible talks about something called the fruit of the Spirit. This is found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Let's, let's read that together. Galatians 5, 16. It says, But I say walk by the Spirit. Now, the word Spirit there is capitalized because it's talking about the Holy Spirit. In, in, the, in the scriptures, it may sometimes refer to your spirit, which is lowercase s, but when it refers to the Holy Spirit, it's capital S. That's how you know whether he's talking about your spirit or the Holy Spirit. He says, but I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. We've all experienced this. We, we know very well in practicality what he's talking about. It's not uncommon for a believer to have multiple desires going on in their life, right? You, sometimes we're shocked by our desires. Well, man, I, as, a, as a Christian, if I'm saved, boy, I shouldn't even desire this. I shouldn't even want this. No, that, that's not the case because you're going to always have desires of the flesh. But he said the desires of the Spirit... Are, are different than that and you are the captain to decide which am I going to yield to. Am I going to yield to the desires of the flesh or am I going to yield to the desires of the Spirit? The Holy Spirit will not make you yield but you choose to yield. And when you do you begin to see something called the fruit of the Spirit in a person's life. Verse 22 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, if you were raised in Sunday school, you probably had to memorize these. You know, and we were taught, oh, you know, there's this many of the fruit of the Spirit, and, and you memorize all the fruits of the Spirit. Um, but I don't believe this is an exhaustive list at all. That was the, not the point of it. The point is that when you yield to the Spirit, you're going to see certain types of evidences and fruits being, being portrayed in a person's life. And it's not just limited to these ones that you see here. Uh, these are a taste of what you get and what you will experience when the fruit of the Spirit is evident and when you see the Holy Spirit working in your life. If, think about in the context of your marriage, just your marriage and family. When I'm yielding to the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You say, well, I'm not seeing any of those things in my family. Well, that's because you're yielding to something else. I guarantee you, you have the Holy Spirit. 
if you're saved and born again. But any of us, no matter how much Holy Spirit you have in you, you can yield to the flesh anytime you want. And when you yield to the flesh, it produces a whole different kind, a whole different kind of fruit. But what we want to do is let the Holy Spirit work and be active in our life and let those fruits come out. I'll tell you a fruit that's not mentioned here, wisdom. Man, praise God for the wisdom of God. Every situation you need, wisdom flowing out. Yeah, that's a fruit of the Spirit. That's not mentioned here. There's a lot of fruits that aren't, aren't mentioned here. So you can see how if you compare a demon-possessed person and a person who's filled with the Spirit, you go, well, th the demon-possessed person looks more uh, dramatic. Well, I'm going to tell you when, you, when you see the life of somebody that is truly filled with the Spirit and these fruits are just overflowing out of their life, I agree, it might not be as dramatic. It's a little more subtle, but we can all look around and find people that are yielding to the Holy Spirit for decades in their life and what kind of fruit that produces. You can look around and you can see it in their marriage. You can see it in their finances. You can see it in their kids. You can see it in every area of their life. That stuff doesn't happen by accident. That's happening because they've been yielding to the Spirit and there's fruit being produced because of it. I want to encourage you to... Um, be intentional about yielding to the Holy Spirit. You might just be starting this journey and you go, well, um, I don't know how to interact with the Holy Spirit. Well, that's where every person starts. Every person starts that way because it's a, it's a relationship that's developed. But did you know, if we go back to what Jesus said, it says that one of his jobs is to teach you. The Holy Spirit can help teach you how to be led by the Spirit of God. And in, in 1 John... John even goes so far as to say you don't actually have to have any other person teach you because really you have the teacher on the inside of you. You have the role of the, the Holy Spirit on the inside of you that can teach you all things. Is it fascinating to anyone else that this is our reality? This is a gift that God has given to every believer to say, I want to live in you, be with you, and guide you through every step of your day, every part of your life, every major decision, every critical thing that comes up in your life. I want to be there and be involved in your life. That's, that's the role of the Holy Spirit. Now, if we're going to begin to see that more in our lives, and, and we could spend another sermon talking about how to be led by the Spirit, and we have. Those are on the website. We've got whole sermon series on the Holy Spirit, uh, multiple series on the Holy Spirit. They're on our website, and we cover a lot of that. Um, but just I, I want you to keep in mind that one of the things that you can do is to stop turning so much to all the other things that you would normally turn to. When you find yourself needing answers, or let, let's just use a simple example. Let's say you're reading your Bible and you read something that you don't understand. What do you do? Do you call the most spiritual person in your life or do you text the most spiritual person in your life and go, hey, can you tell me what this means? Do you Google it? I strongly caution you against that, uh, not against it, but just use caution with that, because you're going to find some crazy ideas out there. Um, do you Google it? What do you do? Because what the Scripture teaches us is that that's one of the primary roles of the Holy Spirit is to lead you into all truth. And so if you're reading your Bible and you come across something you don't understand, I encourage you to stop and ask the Holy Spirit, I'm reading this Holy Spirit, I don't understand what this means. Can you help me? Can you shed light? Can you bring light to this? And watch how the Holy Spirit begins to operate in your life. I'm not saying you're going to hear an audible voice, nothing like that. But in your spirit, you can begin to get revelation. And again, it, ta it's, it takes time. It may not happen the first time you do it. But you take time asking the Holy Spirit. When you have an important decision to make in your life, do you, do you go get counsel from the wisest person in your life? Do you ask? And you can do that. I encourage, the Bible actually tells us to do that, that there's, there's safety in that, in, in the multitude of counsel. I, I do the same thing, very important. But let's not leave out the Holy Spirit either. And actually, when you receive counsel, the, what we ought to do is that the Holy Spirit, it ought to be compared with what we believe the Holy Spirit is showing us in our heart. A lot of times counsel or advice from another person should be confirmation for what you're already getting in your spirit. Not a completely new path or just something that you never thought about. 
if you spent time praying and asking the Holy Spirit, a lot of time you can get counsel from another person and that counsel is a safety to go, uh, it confirms what the Holy Spirit is telling you or sometimes you may go, oh, no, that was completely wrong. I thought I was hearing from God and I'm not. I'm, I'm completely off on that. And that can happen too. But let's not leave out the Holy Spirit in these things. I remember I've, I've had, I could tell you countless stories of how the Holy Spirit has saved me over and over. But I have this, uh, this one memory where I was going to preach a sermon somewhere. And a lot of times when I get uh, asked to preach somewhere else, you know, I've got 20 years of sermons that, I mean, I have saved. And so it's, it's not hard to figure out, all right, what am I going to preach here? Uh, of course, I will always pray and go, is there something unique? Is there something fresh, something I haven't taught on that you won't communicate it here? And I remember I was, I was leaving to go to this, uh, to this meeting where I was going to be preaching. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, yeah, I've got this sermon I'm going to do and, and I'm going to preach it. And it was a sermon I'd preached here before. I was going to preach it. And I remember the Holy Spirit just prompting me in my heart, almost as if to say, yeah, you can just go and do this in your own way, or you can get me involved. And what, what I understood him to say was, yeah, you can depend on that old sermon, or you can depend on me to give you something fresh for, for, this, for this group of people. And I just remember in that moment thinking how easy it is to just leave the Holy Spirit out. Especially the more self-sufficient we get and the more independent we have, we become. It's like we don't almost need God for anything. I mean, my goodness, we got jobs providing the money. We got the church providing the word and worship. We got, uh, you know, Google that knows everything. We got, so you got YouTube show you how to do it. You got all these things that you can just turn to if you want. You can turn to real easy and just turn to those things or you can turn to the Holy Spirit. Nothing wrong with any of those things. And, and, and I use all of those things. But let's not leave the Holy Spirit out. Because the Holy Spirit can show you something that you could have never thought of, that you could have never got from the mind of another person. The Holy Spirit can show you over and over again. And, I, and I'll say in my own life, when, I, when we're trying to make a big decision for the church, big decision in my family, man, we're going to research, we're going to talk, we're going to talk to other pastors, we're going to talk to the board, we're going to get all the input and everything. But all the while we're praying, all the while we're praying, Holy Spirit, what do we need to do here? Where's the peace? Where's the leading? Where's the guidance? Where, what's the Holy Spirit going to do? And ultimately, we have pulled the plug on things because it seemed like we're going this way, but just in our spirits as we prayed, mm -mm, this don't seem right. We're not doing that. We're not going that way. And man, over and over again, the Holy Spirit saves us, and He'll save you from making mistakes. He'll save you from wasting time. He'll save you from wasting money. But it's something that has to be developed, and it, it's something that has to be pursued. Amen? It takes time. Praise God. Let's stand on our feet this morning. Let's bow our heads before the Lord. I, I want to take time just to pray together um, over what we were talking about this morning. Father, we just come to you this morning by the name of Jesus. And first of all, we take time to thank you for the Holy Spirit. God, thank you that what a gift that the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. Lord, we humble ourselves if we're new to this and we say, yeah, we don't know how to grow in this, don't know how to get better at this. Lord, you are the teacher. Holy Spirit is the teacher. So I pray that you would teach us, guide us, help us draw closer to you and utilize this amazing gift of the Holy Spirit that's in our lives. Show us where we're making mistakes. Show us where we're, we're getting off. Show us how to, how to grow in this accurately and correctly in Jesus' mighty name. Now, with every head bowed and eye closed, I want to give you an opportunity if you're here this morning. Maybe you have not come to Christ and you've never submitted your life to Jesus Christ. You've never been born again. In that case, uh, you need to receive salvation so that you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Word of God uh, uh, teaches that this is the process. And the Word of God teaches that salvation 
is very simple. It's very, it's very easy. It comes from believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He came to this earth as a man. He died on the cross to pay the debt for our sin, and that by the power of God, He was resurrected three days later. If you believe that, the Bible says you can receive salvation by believing that in your heart and confessing it with your mouth. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that today. Um, if you say, that's me, I want to pray, I want to give my life to Jesus, then you can do that this morning. Or if you're here and you say, well, no, I'm saved. I've, I've prayed that before, but uh, I know I'm not right with God, and, and I know I've walked away from the Lord, and I want to make a fresh commitment to serve Him, live for Him today, then you can do that as well this morning. We don't want anybody to leave needing that reconciliation with God this morning. We want you to get what you came for this morning. So if that's you, I want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to come down to the front, anything like that. I just want to pray for you in your seat right where you're at. But if that's you, would you lift your hand where you're at? Don't be ashamed. Just lift it up so I can see it. I want to pray over you. Believe God with you. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You can put your hands down. Father, we come to you this morning by the name of Jesus. I thank you for working in hearts and lives this morning. God, thank you for uh, showing your great love to us this morning through worship and through your word. God, I pray this morning over those that have lifted their hand that transformation would happen in their life today, that the miracle of the new birth could occur in their life, that hearts could be reconciled and, and brought back to right relationship with you this morning. God, I pray that you would do the work that only you can do in Jesus' mighty name. Now, if you raise your hand, I want you to pray this prayer with me. You're praying it to God. He's going to hear you. He's listening to you this morning. He's going to respond to your prayer. And all the church can feel free to pray along with us if you'd like to. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I repent of my sin. I ask you to forgive me. Today, I put my faith in Jesus Christ for my salvation. I believe that he is the Son of God. And I want to be a child of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Let's give those a hand that lifted their hand this morning. Amen. Praise God. Listen, if you, if you lifted your hand and you would like to connect with us, uh, we would love to help you on your journey. We have a water baptism coming up on March 24th. We'd love to help you get water baptized if you haven't been baptized, but we can connect with you a couple ways. You can text the phrase Life OLC to 94000 and that'll give you uh, something to fill out that will give us your name and information and someone will contact you this week or in the seat in front of you there's a communication card which you can fill out, tell us the decision you made and drop it in one of the offering boxes along the wall as you leave today. Amen. So glad you came to church this morning. Let me pray over you one more time as we leave. Father, thank you again for working in our church and just blessing us by your spirit today. I pray as we leave that we would leave full of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, everyone said amen. Praise God. Hug somebody before you leave this morning. And you guys are...